for me to ask a question. And I think the who makes a lot of sense. But the like what amount is Hello, hello. Hey, Joe. How's everyone doing? Hey, turkey flag. I know it's your place if I see the turkey flag. This is where I used to live. Wow, right there. What city? Kadakai in Istanbul. That's right, Kadakai. 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 Alyssa, how you doing? Good day? It was good. Yeah, how about you? It was good, yeah. I mean, it was productive. I got some uh, good work done, and I don't think I was into any exercise. It was so cold in the morning, but I had about, I got a couple walks in and a run in, so it turned out to be really good. So awesome. it's just so chilly right now. Wow. Right? I can't decide whether that's better or worse. Like, we, there's not a whole lot of places to go outside. So, like, is it better that it's cold and kind of dreary? That's what I think. From I think more people stay inside now. I mean, if it was 75 every day right now, I think you'd see a lot more people right. outside. Maybe it does help. To, maybe it helps. Maybe the Lord's sending us cold weather because he knows we'd be a bad city. So but anyway, I see uh, Sean's still in Tennessee. See that? Recognize that bedroom. Yep. <laughs> yes, I'm always zooming right here. Always zooming. Always zooming. That miss, you're at your in-law's house then. Yep. John's here. We get more people. Okay, it's six. We're still waiting for our teacher. Hopefully he'll show up. That would be good. Christian's here. Yeah, I want to see you, Christian. Yeah. How's life in Albany Park? We can't hear you. Your, your audio is not working, buddy. Let's see Elaine. Elaine. How's the weather in Tennessee? Let me unmute everybody. We'll unmute everyone until we start. How's weather in Tennessee? It was good, but we had tornado warnings last night, but. Other than that? Yeah, other than that, good. That's good, that's good. Let's see, Christina, hello, hey. hello. Are you in Albany Park too, or did you go to Dallas? I'm in Dallas right now. I'll be back this weekend though. Okay, nice. Yeah. Nice. Did Hector go as well? Yeah, I'm at his parents' house right now. He's on the phone with his, or he's with his mom right now, but yeah. Nice. nice. Yeah. Ladies. Hello. Hi. Hey, how are y'all? Doing good. How are you doing? Good. People are chiming in. Hey, Randall. Randall's here. And John was still waiting for a teacher. Kenton's always late, though. So this is consistent. Don't tell him I said that, but he is. He's always late. So he'll. If he was here on time, he'd have heard you say that. That's right. He's got four kids. So he'll blame it on one of the kids. He's got like. Oh, sure. There it is. Kenton, I was just calling you out. <laughs> I, said, I said you're always late i said he'll blame it on one of the kids he'll, 
he'll pull, I got four sons and he'll blame it on one of the sons. <laughs> I was right? just about to, just about to. All right, they're all chiming in now. Now that you chimed in, they're all little by little. All right. So, so. They up, they're all coming in little by little. Yeah, all right. So we loved the, um, the Easter story. Oh man, I've, I, Hollywood's already reached out. I'm talking to Spielberg in the morning. He thinks I have a few, I gotta give a list of the credit. Just, I'm impressed, like you knocked that out with no child audience. I know, I know, I know, that's what I'm saying. I'm talking to Spielberg at eight in the morning, so he's got, <laughs> he wants to talk, he wants to talk. So, but I, Alyssa gets the credit. She was the one who really made that happen, so I give credit. Uh, don't, don't, don't feed the beast, guys. Do yeah, not feed the beast. On. I thought I crushed it. I don't want to say it, but he's, I think it is. He's hard enough to deal with in the office, man. This is just, this oh, is, uh, it's too much. More, more, too much. more, more. Too much. Come on. Okay, so you got people from all over the country. We got Tennessee represented. All right, Tennessee. We got Dallas. We got uh, Virginia Beach. Um, Al, where are you? Are you? You guys aren't local, are you or no? Me? Yeah, are you local. We're in Air, We're in Arizona. My parents are in Arizona, so. Arizona. Oh. We got Indiana. Wow, you've never taught a class like this with people all over the the country, Kenson. No, I ha I have not. I have not. Oh man. Okay, we'll give him an, okay, one more minute. Is he Chloe and there's the group there? There's the group at Chloe's, all right? Okay, we're gonna honor the time as people more and more chime in. So let me uh, <clears throat> get started. Really excited to have one of our lead pastors, Kenson Lamb. Uh, he's gonna teach on ecclesiology tonight. Um, you guys should all got mm -hmm. my notes earlier that I sent or that Kenson yeah. sent. And so um, let me pray. And then I'm just gonna turn it over to Kenson and Kenson will teach for about 45 minutes. And then uh, we'll do a Q and A like we always do. So same uh, same format. So I'll, I'm gonna actually mute everybody, and then Kenson, when you speak, you can mute yourself. So that was good. I just muted everybody. So Lord, thanks for uh, this day again. <clears throat> Thank you for your kindness. I think this is week four of Zoom, and to see so many faces week after week, uh, we just commit our time to you now. God, keep us attentive, regardless of how busy our day might have been or how slow our day might have been. Pray again, you might encourage our hearts as we learn more about uh, what is the church. Give us a deeper understanding of your love, Jesus Christ, the one who rose from the dead, your love for the bride, the one that you purchased with your blood. And so bless my brother to that end, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. It's all over the country here. Yeah, uh, representing. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, just real quick, some introductions about myself, if you guys don't know who I am. Uh, Ken Sinland, born and raised in uh, Chicago. So, unlike many of you guys, I have actually lived any, nowhere else besides the 606 uh, area code. Uh, came to know Christ around junior high uh, in a church in Chinatown. Uh, met my wife there. Uh, we, this year, we're going to be celebrating 17 years of marriage, and we have four boys. We have a 10-year-old. Uh, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and one-year-old. So I have no doubt that in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, they're going to make their way down here for sure, for sure. So, so with that, today we're going to talk about uh, the th idea of what is the nature of the church, the theology around the church. And I want to get start started off by sharing a book that came out a couple of years ago, ago called Unchristian. Um, this is a book that surveyed thousands of people with this simple question, what is the church. What is the church? And this is what this is what people said. They said that the Christians, the church, are anti-homosexual, 91%, judgmental, 87%, hypocritical, 85%, old-fashioned, political, out of touch with reality, insensitive to others, and boring. So so out of the list of 10, that was the 10 that they gave were the, were the top 10. And what's interesting about that list is that culturally, the church has become more famous for what we oppose rather than who we are for. Now, it's us versus them, good versus bad, Republican versus Democrat. Is this who the church is? Is this what the church is supposed to be? Because when you open up your Bibles and you look at the church 2,000 years ago, it was seen with incredible favor with people. That it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, that the church was enjoying the favor of all people. Now, what happened between now and then is because we have forgotten who we are. So churches end up looking like the world instead of a countercultural kingdom. There's no sacrificing, no discipling, no mission, no feeding the poor, no gospel teaching. 
So simply what I want to do for our time here this evening is I just want to talk about who the church is and what the church is called to do. So to get started, I want to get a working definition going here. And you guys see it in, in the handouts that were sent to you that the definition of the church, and this is my definition of the church that we're going to be using today, is that the church is the treasured people of God who proclaim the glory of the cross to all. The church is the treasured people of God who proclaim the glory of the cross to all. So let me go ahead and try to explain what the church is by kind of taking parts of this definition. So first, the people of God, of God. You know, in John chapter 10, verses, verses 14 and 16, it says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Romans 8.30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. 1 Peter chapter 2, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then finally, Deuteronomy chapter 7. For you, are, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be, the pe to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It's not because you're more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you the fewest of all peoples. Now, let's talk about a few things here. First off is here is this, is the word church. Now, the word church in the Greek is ecclesia, is ecclesia, which means ek is out, and kaleo, which is called out. In other words, the church is the called out people. And who calls out the church? It is God who calls out the church to belong to him. So again, in the verses that I just read, one flock, one shepherd. Those he predestined, he called to himself. And First Peter, you are his possession. You are chosen by him. Now, what this is meant to tell us is that the church are people who have been redeemed by God by putting their trust in Jesus. The church is the people of God because being part of the church has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with God, that we're only the church because God chose us and God calls us. Now, when God says that we are his chosen people, it's not the same thing as God's top choice. Now, what I mean by that is that when you go to a supermarket and you're looking to buy, you know, good quality meat, you know, what, what's that logo that you're looking for? You're looking for a USDA choice that when you see that, you know that you're getting the best of the best. This is not true of the church. We are not USDA choice. Instead, it says that we are chosen. What that means is that when God loved us, it wasn't because we were the best of the best or the brightest. No. There is nothing about us that warranted his love. It was purely an act of grace. When it says that we are chosen, that's a word that alludes to what God says in Deuteronomy 7 to Israel. It says that in verse chapter 7, verse 7, that God chose you not because you were more in number than other people. He said his love and chose you. For you the fewest of all people. God says here, I didn't love you because you're great. You were small. I didn't love you because you were many. You were few. Instead, I love you simply because I chose to love you. The church exists because God was gracious. And what this means is that when it comes to being the church, we should be the humblest people on earth because we received the gospel of grace. But instead, and I'm sad to say this, we have lost sight of this. So the church has become judgmental, has become uncaring. That instead, that instead of the church being a hospital where the spiritually sick can come and find help. It's become legalistic and self-righteous. We stop practicing, practicing hospitality and mercy. We preach a message of fear and condemnation. A church that belongs to God is a people who humble themselves and lay down their rights. It's a people who open their hands and wallets and homes to care for others. It's a people who long to receive grace and to give grace to others. This is what it means to be the chosen people of God. Now, there's some very important implications when we say that the church is of God. 
if the church belongs to God, we also read in scripture that thus Jesus is the head of the church. And it also means that his word has the final authority. Ephesians chapter 5 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come and have first place in everything. So once again, the church belongs to God and not to us. The buck stops with him. We didn't die to redeem the church. Jesus died to redeem the church. So if Jesus is the head of the church, it also means that his words and his teachings must have final authority in all that we say and do as a church. That it's not up for grabs. It's not up to your, up to your opinion. It's not about what's more effective in attracting people into the church. Our job as a church is not to be politically correct, but biblically correct. This also means that ultimately what unifies the church, what is the foundation of the church, is the truth of the gospel. We don't congregate together because we like each other. Now that's important, right? We're a family of God. Friendships happen within church, but that's not the primary reason we come together as a church. That's not the foundation of the church, nor is it because we're committed to a social issue or that we're committed to, the, to a political party. We come together because of the authority and truth of script, scripture. This is what it means to be the church of God. It means that we are committed and submitted to the things of God. Truth's doctrines like Jesus is God, God is the Father, God the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. Jesus is returning. Uh, the Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the only way to salvation. There is a heaven or hell, and hell I mean. It's when a church submits itself to the gospel truths, the church will thrive. That when you read in Acts chapter 2 and you see the early church in community, you see that, every, that these believers are giving their lives to God and they're also devoting themselves to God's word. And they thrive, that people were, that they, that they were, that people were drawn to them because they were not a community that lived selfishly or for earthly pursuits, but they were living for God. So the church, once again, is the people of God. Christ is the head of the church and his word is the authority. And, then, and the second implication of this is that if God is, if the church belongs to God and Christ is the head of the church, an extension of Christ's leadership of the church is to, is to be exercised by qualified male elders who serve under Christ. Acts chapter 20 says this, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock, amongst the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the shepherd of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. First Peter chapter 5 says this, So I will exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. The church is organized by God and it's to be led by under shepherds who reflect the chief shepherd. To be an elder is to lead in a way that looks like Jesus. Now, if you want to read about the qualifications and responsibilities of an elder, it's in 1 Peter chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. You can read it all right there. And as you look at the, our verses here, and as you look at those verses, you'll see that some of the key responsibilities of the elder is that they give oversight to the church, which means vision and leadership. They also give shepherding to the church, that they feed the flock, they protect the flock by guarding doctrine, teaching doctrine. They're responsible to exercise church discipline on those who are unrepentant. They are served with sacrifice and humbleness. They're to be prayerful because Jesus is the head of the church. This should not be a leading that comes from human strength and wisdom, but elders should be led by the Holy Spirit's power and a wisdom from God. Also, as we read from these lists here, that the elders are, be, are to be qualified and competent and spiritually mature men. Now, this is important because Scripture does not call us to submit to the authority of all men. It does not say that whatsoever. We are called to submit to the elders in the church as an elder submits 
to Christ. Now, this is not to say, and I want to be very careful here, to say that men are more capable and special than our ladies. Far from it. We are all equal of value before God because we are all made in his image. But within the church and our families at home, God has assigned different roles for their flourishing. Elders are to lead and non-elders are to submit. And submission is not a bad word. We see it in the Trinity. Jesus submits to God. The Spirit submits to Jesus. Once again, the church is, is to show who God is. And one of the ways that we show who God is is by having these complementary roles and how this plays out. Now, I know right away there's a lot more that can be said. There's a whole lot more questions around this. This is why that we'll have later on a whole session dedicated around this very topic, around women in leadership and complementarianism and egalitarianism and all that. So to recap, the church belongs to God. Jesus is the head. His words and teachings have the final authority. And God has raised up elders to serve as his shepherds over the flock. Now, here's the next part of the definition. The church is the people, people of God. Now, that sounds obvious, but it needs to be mentioned that the church is not an individual. The church is a community. It's a family. You know, what we saw in our verses earlier is that it's a chosen people, not a chosen person. It's not one sheep, but it's the flock. And also, when you look in other places in Scripture, the church is always described in the plural, household of God. It's the building. It's the temple made of many bricks, right? It's not one brick, but it's a building. It's not one family member, but a household. It's not just one body part. It's the body of Christ. The church is not less than one person, but it's more than just one person. As a Christ follower, in redemption, we have the privilege to call God as our Father, which is incredible. So we have that vertical relationship. And by default, we also have horizontal relationships because if he's our dad, it means that we also have other brothers and sisters in the faith who also call him dad. There is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Now, let me give you a couple of implications of, of why this is so important. First is this. The church is never a building. It's always a people. Like, for example, we say stuff like, it's time to go to church. Now, normally we think that when we, now normally when we, we think when we say stuff like that, we're talking about a building. And I say stuff like that too, see you guys at church, right? But theologically, it's actually wrong to use church in that way because the building is not the church. The building is the place where the church meets in. So even if the building was to burn down or if a quarantine was to shut it down, the church would still exist. The church would still worship because the church is the people of God who have been saved by God. And it's for this reason the church in persecuted countries like China are growing because they're not confined to walls and zip codes or to cathedrals. The church is wherever the people of God are at. It can be in buildings, schools, huts, open, field, ho open fields, homes, anywhere. The church is a sent people of God. Here's the second implication. The church is visible and invisible. Now, what I mean by that is that the invisible church is the church is as God sees it, and the visible church is is the church as Christians on earth see it. That the universal church, the invisible church, is all God's people in all times, past, present, and future, and places. If right now you are a redeemed follower of Jesus Christ, you belong to the universal church, to the invisible church here. And then we also have local churches. They are smaller and temporal gatherings of the universal church where Christians assemble as God's people. This is the most common usage of church in the New Testament. It's the local church. Now, what this means is that if you are a believer, you should belong to a local church. Now, sometimes people might say, well, you know, if I'm a believer and I'm part of the universal, universal church, that's good enough. You know, I don't need to commit myself to, to a local church. Now, it is true that if you're saved, you're part of the universal church, but it doesn't stop there. You live out this beautiful truth of redemption in a local way. This is why Paul plants 
local churches and rights to local churches and raises up local elders. Our membership in the universal church is reflected in our membership in the local church, that we show that beautiful reality of being part of the universal church by our commitment in our church homes right now. Here's, the, here's another implication, is that since the church is the people of God, it also means that sometimes churches can be a big mess. In the universal invisible church, the only members are the redeemed and saved, so it's always going to be perfect. But the local church is made up of saved people and also lost people. Now, they might look like Christians. They might use the Christian lingo, but they haven't been regenerated. They haven't been born again. It's also within the local church, the saved are still in the process of sanctification. So the local church, as we currently see it from our earthly perspective, can involve a lot of different dynamics in that. And because of that, and because of the presence of sin in our world and in our lives, churches need to mature in their faith. It means that churches are prone to stumbling in sin. In Revelation, we see the seven churches, and many of them are on the brink of being snuffed out by God because they're faithless, they're useless, they're truthless for the kingdom. You know, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, to the church in Ephesus, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, from its place, unless you repent. Also, Jesus and Paul warns us of people wanting to harm the church. Acts 20. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own, your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, inwardly the ravenous wolves. So it's very possible that within a local church to have these wolves, to have these false prophets. And because of this, churches at different varying degrees can have health and fruitfulness. Once again, for, for example, the church in Philippi and Thessalonica, when Paul writes to them, he's really encouraged by them. However, when he writes to the churches in Galatia and Corinth, there's all sorts of doctrinal and moral issues that he has to get after. Not all local churches are the same. Now, this is really important to remember because first off, no church is ever going to be perfect and there's always going to be stuff to work on. I say this because so often when people are church hopping or looking for a church, they set all these incredibly high standards, like it has to have this, has to have this, have to have this, you know what I mean? No church is going to be perfect. So don't get all judgmental and critical. Instead, be helpful. Jesus didn't love the church because it was lovely. He loved the church to make it lovely. You know, one of the most convicting things I actually heard around something like this is that, some, is that a while ago, you know, someone was talking about, you know, how much like they, how many problems they saw within the church. Like they saw this issue with, you know, with, with their care ministry. They saw this issue with how they did small groups. They saw this issue with how they did their Sunday gatherings. And this person just kept bringing up issue after issue after issue and said, because of all these issues, I can't commit to this church. But then the pastor of that church lovingly said to this person, instead of get out, I don't want to talk to you anymore, said, could it be possible that the reason that you're seeing all these issues is not for you to walk away from the church, but it's for you to step in and to begin to help build the church. Here's the second thing to keep in mind, because the church is made up of people. This is also why we need strong elders to lead and protect the church with grace and truth, because the church is constantly being bombarded by Satan and his demons and, and sin. And, and there's just a constant attack on the church. There's a spiritual warfare that is going on, and we need leaders and elders to help lead the church to defend us in that way. And finally, there are churches that are the redeemed people of God, but they can also be spiritually anemic. They don't preach the gospel regularly. They're not committed to missions and evangelism. They're more excited over production than prayer. Do not commit yourself nor recommend these churches to others. It will be toxic and spiritually uh, in a spiritually hindering environment. Pray for them and see their flourishing. The local church is prone to dangers and weaknesses, so we always need to be 
diligent and alert and discerning. And here's one of the final things I want to say about this. Since the church is the people of God, it's meant to be multi-ethnic. When you read the book of Acts and the New Testament, a lot of the fighting that happens is between Jewish and Gentile believers, that the Jews believe that because of their upbringing, they are the preferred people of God. So they tell the Gentile believers that before you can become part of the church, you need to be culturally Jewish first. Paul completely dismantles that, completely. He blasts, he puts it on full blast. He can't stand it. He says in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, that he is a Jew who is one inwardly. He says that by saying a true Jew is no longer defined by, you know, your ethnicity or where you're born and, or who you're raised, but a true Jew is one that is spiritual, that it's any believer whose heart has now been cleansed by God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, this entire verse, this entire passage speaks, to the strong, to, speaks so strongly about the unity of Jews and Gentile believers being one in the body of Christ. That the church is no longer one ethnicity in one geographical area, but the church is to be in all nations. It's to be Jews and Gentiles, every tribe, nation, and tongue. Ephesians 2.14 says that every dividing wall of hostility has been torn down, which means that the cultural things that brought separation between Jews and Gentiles have now been replaced with a greater gospel ethic of reconciliation. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor th free, nor there is male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse doesn't mean that our race and culture doesn't matter. Instead, what it says is that before I'm Asian or white or black or Latino, male, female, young, old, I am first a Christ follower. So what this means is that since my race and culture is not what defines or values me, but it is Christ who defines who I am. So diversity, instead of being a point of separation in the church, it becomes a point of celebration because Christ has redeemed all things. That the church is the people of God, which means that we should look like all people. Okay? So that's, so that's the first phrase, okay? I promise that we're going to move faster, okay? Now here's the next thing I want to look at. The church is the treasured people of God the treasured people of God. You know, a couple of verses. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is very special to Jesus. He built his church, which means that he owns the church. Now, for some of you guys, this is actually pretty easy to understand because there's a major difference between owning something and renting something. And one of the biggest differences is that when you own, you care more. For example, like in my case here, that when I jump on an Uber or a Lyft, you know, I don't really care what happens to the car. You know what I mean? Like the person is driving me around because it's their car. I just want to get to one spot to another. However, if I'm driving my car, I care very much about what happens to my car. In the same way, God says that I build my church. The church belongs to him. In Ephesians 5, Paul teaches us the depth of love in marriage and the best example that he can think of when it comes to this special kind of love is the love between Christ and the church. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says that the church is a people for his own possession. Now, I don't really like that translation because I think it's kind of weak. A better way to say that phrase is that we are a people who are incredibly special to him. That for God, the church isn't just something he possesses, but it's something that's special to him. Now, I say that because when you think about it, God being God, he already owns everything. He possesses everything. So it's no big deal when it says that we belong, that, we, that God possesses us. But what makes us unique is of all the things that God possesses in the universe, we, the church, are special to him. 
you know, for example, if you've ever, ever gotten that icebreaker question, you know, in like little like groups, you know, if your house was burning down and you could only grab one thing, what would it be, you know? And for me, it would be, you know, my photo albums, you know, that I, I grew up in a time before there was digital cameras and the existence of the cloud. And so these would be like my, my wedding photos, my school photos, growing up with my old friends, pictures of my baby, you know? These photos are important to me and I will go into harm's way to save them. They're irreplaceable. In the same way, this is how God sees us. He treasures his church. And what that means for us is that if God treasures the church, we should too. You know, oftentimes I hear people saying, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. The church is full of hypocrites. The church is irrelevant. The church is hateful. Now, I know that when it comes to the church, the church, once again, can be really messy. It can be, be made up of really messy people. It can, be, it can be led by pastors and elders and small group leaders who have their own sins and insecurities to work through. The church is far from perfect. If you guys have been keeping up with the news at all, there's, there have been so many lead pastors that have been falling away for different types of moral failures, financial failures, abuse of, spiritual abuse of authority, all sorts of different reasons. But even with all that, we shouldn't give up on the church, nor should we say that we hate the church. Once again, Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That again, the Apostle Paul is teaching husbands how to lead and sacrifice in their marriage. And he uses Jesus as an example that as he sees the church, he loves his church as he would his bride and gives his life for her. One reason why we should never say that we hate the church is because Jesus would never, ever say that. For us to say that would be offensive for him to hear. For example, uh, let's just imagine that I'm, I'm just going to pick on Joe here, okay? I know him best. So I'm talking to Joe Riccardi, and Joe's like, Kenson, man, I love you, bro. You're the best, man, bro. You know, you and me at Sapori's all day, every day. But can I just tell you something? Your wife and your kids, dude, I can't stand them. I hate them. They are ugly. They're a bunch of losers. But you, Kenson, you, I love you. I can't live without you. Can I just say something? Joe, you and I, we're going to have some problems because I don't care how much you love me. That's my family. That's my bride. In the same way, God would say, those are my people that I've given my heart to. They are my treasure that if you fail to love them, you are failing to love the very thing I love. This is why the church should be precious to us because it's precious to God. You know, consider all that he did for his church. Christ founded the church. Christ purchased it, purchased it with his blood. Christ identifies with the church that as he, he stops Paul in his tracks, right? On, on, on Damascus, and, and, he, and he says, like, why are you persecuting me, right? He says that, why are you persecuting the church? He's, he's identifying himself as the church. The, the, the church is the body of Christ. Uh, the church is the dwelling place of the Spirit. The church is the chief way. God is going to glorify himself. Once again, we didn't die for the church. Jesus did. He treasures it with his life, and we should do as well. As well. Now, here's the final statement of the definition. And this actually just answers that one part. What is the church called to do? The church is the treasured people of God, and this is what they're called to do, who proclaim the glory of the cross to all, to all. So once again, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now notice that, that is who you are. That purpose statement, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And John chapter 17, verse 18. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Now, once again, and first Peter again, notice what Peter does. That before he talks about what the church does, he reminds them of who they are. 
that our identity as a church is not rooted in what we do, is not rooted in how busy we are, is not rooted in how productive we are. Our identity is first and foremost rooted in who we are in Christ and what he has done. So as we remember how loved we are, how accepted we are, how treasured we are in Christ, we can then go out for him in boldness and joy. And I love this aspect of the gospel because as a church, we're not first defined by our actions. A true church of Christ will be defined by Christ's actions. And because of that, we will have actions. We, as First Peter says, will be proclaiming the good news. Verse 9 in First Peter, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous, marvelous light. Now, what is this excellencies that the church is supposed to proclaim? It's the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross because it's in that work that brought us out of darkness into that light. So what that means for us as a church is that we do not exist to proclaim health, wealth, and prosperity. We proclaim Jesus. It means that we're not here to pro proclaim how the church is to be a service provider. We're here to proclaim Jesus and how he calls us to come and die. It means that we are not here to proclaim that a church that the church is here so that you may have your best life now. We are to proclaim Jesus and to surrender our lives to him. So we proclaim it on Sundays. We proclaim it when we pray, when we sing, when we greet, when we give. We proclaim it in our small groups when we care for each other and hold each other accountable. We proclaim it to those who don't follow Jesus. We proclaim it to the needy and underserved. We proclaim it in our work, in our school, in our marriage, and how we handle money and how we choose to entertainment. The church is the redeemed people of God. So wherever we go, so goes the good news. You know, in John 17, Jesus prays before he gets arrested and crucified. And the one thing that he prays over and over again is for God to be glorified through the church. Then in John 17, a couple of verses that I highlighted, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Verse four, verse four I glorified you on earth. Verse five, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Verse 10, I am glorified in them. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Notice that in the center of everything, that as he talks, as Jesus talks about his relationship with the Father, and as Jesus talks about us, the church, notice that the center of it all is not us. It's not, it's not me. It's not you. It's the glory of of God as shown through the gospel of Jesus Christ. All that the church of God does is for this one purpose, it's for God's glory. Now, a way to see this is by seeing the ministry of the church in three categories. That there's an inward aspect, an outward aspect, and an upward aspect. Inward, outward, and upward. That inward is ministry to believers. It's nurturing, equipping, building up the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 says, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Colossians 1, 128, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So one responsibility that the church is to have is to, is to help build up and equip believers. Then you also have the outward component, ministry, of, ministry to the world, evangelism, compassion, justice, and mercy. We see this again in Matthew 20, chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The concentration is on unbelievers. And then finally, we have upward, the ministry that is towards God. It's worship and exaltation. And the concentration here is towards Christ. And out of all three categories, this one is the most important, which is worship, because out of our love for God overflows in love to the church and also to the world. So once again, a healthy church, what will it be doing? What will it be practicing? It will be inward, outward, and upward. And all three of these areas will be driven because they are proclaiming the glory of the cross 
to all. First off, the, the church is committed to the ministry of believers because of the glory of the cross. Because the cross is not just the ABCs of our faith. It's not just something that you pray to accept Jesus and then you forget about it. The glory of the cross in the gospel is the A to Z of our faith. That as we grow in Christ's likeness, we only do so because we're preaching the gospel to ourselves. This is how we disciple one another towards spiritual maturity. We are growing in the gospel. So a church that is committed to the glory of the cross will equip other believers. It will help other believers to grow. The church is also committed to the ministry of unbelievers because we're committed to the glory of the cross. Because the God who brings us in is also the God who sends us out. In Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. That we go out because Jesus saves, Jesus transforms, Jesus can turn a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. That we know that because of Jesus, salvation is possible. That when we believe with faith and confess him, we can have salvation. That is good news. That is the glory of the cross, and we're meant to share this. Matthew 16, 18 says this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's been said that the church is not a cruise ship, but a battleship. And this verse would agree, because Jesus built his church, and he says the gates of hell don't stand a chance against it. The last time I remember, gates don't move. So it's the church that is fighting against the forces of evil. The glory of Christ is the one that is going out, and it is what, and it is what can't be stopped. You know, John Piper, a pastor, once said this about world mission. He says that missions exist because worship doesn't. God is so committed to his glory that he calls the church to go to the, to go to the very ends of the world, to go to all nations to make the cross known. And then finally, the upward category, it's for the glory of Christ we worship now and forever. Revelation 5.13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. When the end of time comes, notice who is sitting on the throne. It says that it's the lamb that's on the throne. Not a lion, not a dove, but for all eternity, every tribe, tongue, and nation will be worshiping the lamb. Why? It's because the very glory of God is seen in the gospel. The lamb represents the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. And this is the very good news that will light up heaven and give us reason to sing. Also, just this past Easter Sunday, just, just yesterday, yesterday, I preached from Luke chapter 24. And when Jesus shows up to, the, who, to his disciples who are doubting, who are hurting, who can't believe that he's resurrected, the first thing he does is that he shows him his hands and his feet. Why? Because that's where the nail scars are. Did you realize that for all eternity, on Christ's resurrected body, these nail scars will always be there? Why? Because they will be a permanent reminder to his people of how much he loved them and what he was willing to do to save them. Proclaiming and enjoying the glory of Christ will be something that we will do for all eternity. So even in eternity, when we don't necessarily, when we don't need to continue to build up and mature the believers of Christ, or nor do we need to proclaim the gospel so that others would be saved, we're still going to be proclaiming the glory of Christ because that's the best news that we have. Consider this. Worship is the central activity of heaven. The church should be no different. It's meant to be a picture of what happens when God reigns. So to wrap us up here, once again, our definition the church is the treasured people of God. That is who we are, who proclaim the glory of the cross to all, to believers, unbelievers, and anyone else in between. That is what we are called to do. And I will stop there. Th th thank you, guys.
Wonderful, Kenson. I uh, really appreciate that. We got lots of questions. Folks, I do want to remind you all that we, um, Michaela actually reminded me, we are going to have a whole session devoted to complementarianism. So I would prefer um, maybe most of the questions around here more geared towards uh, the church and questions that might have come out of this only because I think the date is uh, April 20th. So it's actually two weeks from tonight, I think is the date that we're gonna, yeah, April 27th is complementarianism. So we'll have a whole hour class devoted to that. So I'd rather save it for then, unless there's just something so pressing you wanna ask, which please do. But if you have questions around the church with Kenson shared, please, now's the time. Yeah, also guys, I was looking at my notes, so I couldn't see all the things that you guys were talking I don't. I didn't realize you guys were talking about Chinatown. I was me. <laughs> that was me. I said you got to give them what your favorite go to. If there's one Chinatown restaurant. What's the one? You go. Oh, we'll what, end what, with what, that. We'll what, end. What, what, we'll, we'll end well, well, none of them are open right now, so I don't know how that's going to work out. But okay. I know, and I did clarify. Kenson likes Italian people. He doesn't like Italian food. I, I can't. I can't stand. I can't stand Italian food. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. his wife loves Italian food. He she, does. She does. She does. She does. So, so maybe on a date night, I'll take her out to Olive Garden. That's right. You know? Yeah. Don't get me going with Kenson and my cousin's restaurant. We had, it's a hot subject for us. But anyway, questions, anyone? Anyone questions on the church? What is the church, the local church? I think Christian Matthew looked like he was ready, but maybe not. Um, yeah, I, I do actually have a question, Joe. Um, so. Yep. You got to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Christian. We can't hear you. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yep. I'm having issues. Um, was wondering, uh, is there any difference now in the New Testament uh, towards, um, like, like you, you uh, quoted some Old Testament passages um, that were specifically geared towards Israel and Jewish people. Are there, is there any relevance uh, today for Jewish people, the nation of Israel, um, in relation to the church? Yeah, so, uh, Christian, great question. So, <laughs> actually, if you guys want to wait till the fall, uh, we're going to continue on with the second half of Romans, and we're going to jump right into the deep end uh, of what it means uh, for, for to be Jewish, Israel, the church. Um, so, the quick answer to that, um, and this is my position on this, yeah. Um, is that what has happened is that, as I read earlier from, from Romans chapter 9, is that, a, is that a true Jew is one that is one inwardly. So that I believe now that what makes up the church is no longer a specific people group, the nation of Israel, but now all the promises that were promised to Israel and to the Jews have now been transferred over to the church, which can include mess Messianic believers, right, Jewish believers, but also to Gentile believers as well too. So I believe that we have been grafted in uh, to that. So, for example, um, do I believe that the church, uh, that Israel might have a specific, that God might have a specific salvation plan for them? Uh, I do not believe so. I believe that now the church has become uh, the, the fulfillment of, of Israel, the spirit, spiritual Israel in, in that way. So I know that's a much more complicated question, but I, I do not believe that there's anything distinct between Israel and the church in the New Testament now. I think Romans... Yeah, not eight, nine, and ten, and eleven handle it pretty well. And as Kenson alluded to, there are many godly men and women who hold to a position called dispensationalism that really uh, got birthed from. I've shared this before, Moody Semi Moody Theolog Moody Bible in Dallas Seminary, where they would say God keeps His promises to Israel. So God made promises to a specific people. So Erwin Lucha, the former pastor of Moody Church, would often say something like, I believe it because God made, God God keeps his promises, and he made a promise to the people of Israel. So like Kenson alluded to, I, I would lean towards what Kenson kind of speaks on, but there are many godly men and women, um, and Park doesn't have an official position on that. We'll preach it coming up, God willing, in the fall. But um, yeah, that's a big, that's a big uh, I don't want to say a big can of worms, but definitely a big theological discussion. Good. What else? What else, friends? What else? Wow, silence. Kenson, talk about, I mean, so like you made a comment, like you talked about 
coronavirus right now. We haven't met. Easter, the church is scattered. Yeah. So would you believe the church is not meeting right now? I mean, there's been no gathering. Uh, everything's been remote, kind of like this. So would you say right now, um, the local, in light of what's happening, uh, the local church is not, is not happening right now? Yeah, you know what? That, that's a that's a fascinating question because, uh, like for example, if you were to, let's just say, like maybe uh, two months ago, two months ago before we got into quarantine, right? Everything was normal, you know, all that stuff. And someone came to me and says, "Hey, you know what? Like, uh, I don't go to a physical location. Uh, yeah. My my church is online." I would have said to them, "I was like, that's that that's that's not church. That's not church." Uh, but what's what's ironic about that is that that's exactly what we're all doing right now. Is that, is that on Sundays we're pretty much watching each other online and 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 so forth. So, so all that so all that to say is is what we're doing right now. Are we being part of the church when we gather in our homes, maybe by ourselves with our family, and we're just watching our pastor on the screen? What I would say is that yes, we are being the church, not in an ideal sense but we're being in the church in the sense of, of what, of what God intended. And, and what, what I mean by that is that when, when people usually get virtual with, you know, their church commitments, it's usually because they're not committed. They're not tied down. They don't want to be committed or tied down. They kind of want to have their buffet of how they want to experience church. That's not what's happening right now. That because of a unique season and time in our life, sure. you know, we have to meet in this way. But yet the commitment to the gospel, the commitment to community, the longing for community, the submission to eldership, it's all there. You know what I mean? So I believe that because of all those different elements, yes, you know, because of this unique season, you know, I believe that we are the church. And what actually what this has really made me really sympathetic to and really empathetic to is also to the, to the persecuted church. That what we're doing here and being isolated in our homes, this is new for us. This is not new for them, you know, that they're not able to meet on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. It might be like very few and in between. Sometimes, you know, a pastor might not be able to lead their family in communion. So are, is the family never to receive communion, you know, because they, they just can't do it, right? So like, so it's made me really like just empathetic just in terms of just what they go through and, and, how, and how creative they need to be in experiencing church. But also the beauty of it all, too, is that I believe that it's within the Bible. There's a reason why I don't think the Bible talks so much about how things have to be done in this particular way. But it's more so driven around kind of the principles and, and, what, and, and, what, and, uh, and basically the function, like what has to happen, but not necessarily how it has to happen. And I believe that it gives the gospel a lot of agility, a lot of movement, so they can go into all these different cultures. So it doesn't have to do one thing in a very specific way but that we can preach the gospel in a very contextual way. So, 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 all, that, so all that to say is that this yeah. is not an ideal season. Communion on Good Friday was not ideal. I would not recommend it that way. Mm. But I think for the season that we're in, the unique season, I do believe that the scriptures give us permission for this. You know? I, would, I would echo that, Kenson. I would just add, like you were alluding to that, at least in our country currently, so once God willing this ends, every uh, mature a mature believer would realize the scriptures talk about the church gathering and so we, we, we're coming together right so that's why we're even careful to use i think kenson has the same sentiment we don't really say we're doing this is church we're we're offering a broadcast right now for you all on the weekends uh, just to be as a blessing i think i found out from rafe kenson's my good friend kenson's good friend you guys actually put up your easter broadcast on saturday night they just said on saturday at nine, nine o'clock hey it's up and running do whatever you want to use it um and so we would say uh yeah god willing once this ends and we want to honor you know the government you know obviously you know honor the government here what they're saying now that those would bring up some other questions if they say hey we would prefer the church never to meet again obviously that will bring up a whole other series of questions but generally speaking because of the time we're in we're honoring the government but then when we're allowed to come together again and gather, uh, a, a genuine mature and believer would be like, I'm excited. Yes, of course. That's a biblical pattern in the New Testament as the church gathers, the church gathers. So um, good, good, good. Um, what about uh, my reads question? I went recently went through the process of finding the right church in Chicago. Why are local churches so hard to find in cities like Chicago? Wow. 
big cities that need, that's a good, uh, yeah, Kenson, why don't you take a stab? And if you're wrong, I'll correct you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my son's coming down here real quick. Okay. Hey, hey can, can, can you say hi real fast? Hi. Say hi, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, oh my God. Right. What's his name? Uh, this, this one's an Ethan. He's the yeah, second he's, oldest, he, right or no? Third or he, second? He's a, he, he's the second oldest, and he, he's our wild one. He's going to be our future CEO because he loves to boss people around. I so love that's it. Why that's why he's down here because he can't obey any rules. So, oh my gosh, okay. Ethan, upstairs. we need your dad for a little bit more. Okay, I'll see you upstairs in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I totally missed that question. How's how's hearing you come it's downstairs? In the, in the chat room. It's in the chat room. In the chat session there. Okay, I see it. I see it. Why are local churches so hard to find? Um, if, I, if I can ask, uh, when, when you say why are local churches so hard to find in cities like Chicago, um, are, are you talking, um, may I ask, like, are, are you talking about like gospel preaching local churches or? Um, because, because yeah. I, I guess what I mean is that you just Google churches, you'll find a ton on Google in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, so you can find a ton of churches, but then you go through exactly like what you had written down, at, like inward, outward, upward, and it's really hard to find just a solid church. Granted, I, I'm so glad I came back from Park or came back to Park, whatnot, but it was a, it's a really difficult search, and you would think that in a huge city, one that has so much destruction in it, that there would be a lot of churches that would be like building it up. And I had just a really hard time finding it, which was, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, well, well yeah, you know, you, you bring up a really, um, a really, really good point here. Um, this is why for us as a church at park, we are so committed to church planting at, at uh, works, like whether we support and give money and people and whatever and resources to other people, the church plant, or for us to church plant uh, is because, and this is why we're very specific when we say that we want to plant gospel preaching churches, because we know that there is uh, a shortage of that across our entire city. Now, uh, reasons for that um, are pretty, pretty diverse around it, but I think a couple of reasons why. Um, first off is that um, when you preach the Bible faithfully, it doesn't make you very popular. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't draw people in. And even just speaking frankly and honestly, like the type of favor that God's given Park is pretty rare. You know what I mean? The way that we preach the gospel and the positions that we hold, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, it's kind of like Jesus. When Jesus built the crowds, he started saying stuff like, you know, you know, eat my body, drink my blood. And they're like, what? They're like the disciples are like, hey, if you want to build a movement, don't talk like that. But Jesus was constantly trying to find ways to thin the crowds out because, you know, and the way he did it was actually by talking about, you know, just the gnarliness of the gospel, you know, of, of what it means to follow him, hate mom and dad, give up everything. It's just an incredibly unpopular message. And, and that, that's one that's not going to fill seats. Um, that's not one that's going to bring in the money, per se, within the church. And, and, and that also builds into maybe sometimes the motivation and the leadership that builds the church. You know, sometimes you just have to ask, like, you know, what, what is the commitment to the gospel work that they're in? Or is it sadly to say, and I've met plenty of pastors, so has Joe, that you can tell right away when you meet a pastor that it's all about turf force. It's all about this, this, this is my kingdom. And that's just, um, and th th yeah, th there's just a sadness to it. It's interesting. When I first moved into to Bridgeport, where we planted uh, our church about three years ago, um, I made visits um, to all the neighboring churches. And in one of the visits, um, I actually had one of my key leaders actually go to the church just to say hi, you know, I, you know, just, just to get to know folks, you know, get to experience what they're worshiping. And as soon as my leader met the pastor and say, hi, you know, my name is Carissa, you know, we're, we're going to plant a church here in six months. The pastor just turned his back on her and walked away in mid sentence, you know, and my Carissa was talking to me and she was crying. She's like, what's going on here? And, you know, it's just one of those things where like, you know, sometimes like it's just, um, you have things like that. So, all that says that there's numerous reasons why, like there's a there's a such a lack of gospel preaching churches, but it's a whole bunch of different factors. Spiritual maturity, it's tough to preach a biblical message, um, and also doing ministry in the city is really really hard. It it will chew you up real fast. Uh, it's because when you're in the suburbs, it's pretty much basically a monocultural 
a, a model. It's just a, the same demographic. So you, so you, and it's usually pretty affluent. So you don't have a whole lot of issues to deal with. But when you're in the city, man, you have got to like know how to navigate culture, difficult issues that when the first things ever happen in the world, they always happen in the city. So, so that responsibility falls on a city church to try to work through that. That's hard to do. That's really, really hard to do. You know, so that might be another reason why sometimes churches just go to greener pastures. And if I can say that, you know, to, to, to easier, easier lands, you know, um, but for us at Park here and for many churches that we know, you know, we really believe that God, God's called us here to the city. You know, this is what, this is what God's called us to do. Can yeah, Joe, we, say, Joe, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, this is Diane. Um, can I just say we lived in the suburbs for a long time mm -hmm. and it's not much better not to be yeah. discouraging but it's not much better in the suburbs so sorry to be discouraging but um yeah we i'm old and we've been to a lot a lot of different churches in this city in chicago and it's really hard to find a good bible preaching um good foundational church uh, it just is and i for all the reason that kenson named um they're hard to find. We even started a church, my husband and I, in the, the western suburbs because it was it was hard to find a good, you know, intense um, Bible preaching church because it's it's hard. Yeah, I, I want to get two similar questions at the end there, um, but I would just add also, Marie, there are a bunch of. Um, we're just encouraged by a lot of vibrant gospel works that we are seeing. They just look real different. I mean, they might be smaller, like even, uh, yeah, so it's happening. I would tell you that it is happening. But also the other big thing maybe Kenson might have forgot was that there's such a pressure to cave to culture is what we're seeing as well. So you look at cultural norms today, and it's very easy for a church to either avoid them. And we're not going to talk about that because that will not make people, obviously sexuality is a big one. And we're going to be talking about that here in a few weeks. Uh, but let's not go there. Let's not talk about that. You know, let's keep that quiet or or let's actually cave to what we think culture says we ought to be. So that's one of the reasons you're seeing a lot in urban centers as well, because people lose the gospel, the sense of gospel centrality and like being unapologetic. But there are vibrant works happening there. I will say that we're a part of some partnerships. So, um, Kenson, what about... Uh, uh, let's get to the, they're about kind of two in the same, but I love, someone says, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I, I'm just, I'm all about Jesus. I, I want to go share my faith with people. I just am not big into being a part of the local church. I just, I don't know, like um, the local church isn't for me, but I love Jesus and let's, come on, let's do this. Oh, uh, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's the big miss. That's a big miss uh, for a couple, for a couple of reasons. Uh, for, first, first off is, is this, okay. Um, Love the fact that you want to evangelize and you want to share your faith, right? That's fantastic. Praise God for that. Um, serve, I want to serve. I want to serve. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's that that's fan, that's fantastic. Uh, but again, you're you're, miss, you're missing the very beauty of what it means to be part of a church community. Well, let me let me describe it in a, in a, in a, in this way. Currently, people don't really care about going to church. It's kind of like they go in, it's kind of like, oh, it's boring. You know, there's nothing going on. You know, like it's the same old thing over and over again. And I think a reason why people are not excited to go to church is because they're not living on mission every day. If you're living on mission every single day and you're putting your neck out there and people are just giving you like the weirdest looks, you know what I mean? Like, what? What do you believe? Well, what are you saying? Get out of here. You know what I mean? The one time a week where you don't feel like you're crazy is on Sunday mornings. You get together with your family of God and all of you are sharing these crazy, gnarly stories and stories of like, I shared my faith here, I shared my faith here. And that's where you spur each other on to say, let's keep doing this, let's get after it. For someone who wants to spread the mission of, G of the gospel, you know, to, to, to serve others, you're gonna fizzle out pretty fast if you're not tied to a church community. It's, it's the very way you find encouragement and camaraderie around that. So that's one reason. The second reason, too, is that, is that just let's just suppose that you are sharing the gospel. How are you going to holistically disciple this person in the faith? You know, like, you know, bringing them to faith is one thing, but you also have to have them mature as a Christ follower. You're not meant to do that alone. That's why in Scripture you have all these one another's. You can't, like, you can't be a mature Christ follower 
and not be connected to a church. You can't be an obedient Christ follower and not be connected to a church because how can you obey the one another? So you, you can't do it if you're not connected to a Christian community. So again, evangelism is great, but at the same time, how, how about that whole, the holistic discipleship piece? How about growing in accountability? You know what I mean? Like they're just all, and, and also as well, too, you're, you're missing a beautiful dynamic of what it means to be part of the family of God, God being father, brothers and sisters in Christ. And quite honestly, a lot of our sanctification happens amongst one another. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know about you guys, but some of the most difficult situations I've gone, gone through haven't actually been with unbelievers. It's actually been with fellow believers as we're working out our sanctification. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And that's where it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen, you know, within the church. So all that to say is that I appreciate the person wanting to share the gospel, but it is a very shallow view yeah. uh, of what it means to have faith in Christ. Yeah. And I would just add, cause it's a hot topic for me. That's a red flag for anyone that you would meet. So if you meet anyone who's like, I love Jesus. I just do, do the church in your mind right now should be red flag. I'm concerned about this person because they're, they're revealing something about themselves. I've never, I've never read a great biography of someone who's done great things for God. And part of the biography was, I just don't belong to a church though. I do it my own way. I've, I've yet to read that biography. So if you find that, send that to me. Uh, Hebrews 13 says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they giving watch over your souls. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Who are your leaders? Oh, you don't have to have leaders. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, you, you get me going here. Uh, and, like, and then like Kenson said at Colossians 3, that's one example. Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with, how do you bear with one another if you don't, is it just your three best friends? You, you form your own, hey, we're gonna have our own group. We're gonna have 10 people that are all, but who do you bear with? If someone has complaints, forgive one another put on love. So um, definitely red flags, friends. If you meet someone, uh, maybe some people here are single and you, and all of a sudden you start dating someone and they say, oh, I don't do the church thing, but I love Jesus. No, 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 no. I'm concerned about you. Um, so uh, anyway, that's just very concerning. And we obviously we see that people want to do their own thing. Um, I saw a guy who's married, recently married. She used to be a part of Park and and he, he never was, but he, oh, if you're looking for a church, come be a part of our chat on Sunday morning. I'm like, bro, so come on. So I wanted to be like, don't be a part of it. But anyway, okay, enough. Um, Kenson, last question from Christina. <laughs> the words talk so much about the good question, the unity and oneness of his church. How do we do this well with churches? We have different theological stances, but still believe this, still believe Jesus Christ is Lord. So cessationalism meaning the gifts have ceased. John MacArthur believes that, right? One of the greatest theologians of our day or continualism, like it still goes on. People that have views on baptism, Tim Keller believes in infant baptism. We say, no, 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 no. The scripture clearly teaches believers baptism. We have churches that we, we love that believe uh, women in leadership, uh, women as elders. Um, and and uh, complementarian says, no, role is male. Um, what would you say to that? That's a good, like, that's a very, that's another good question. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's exactly the things that we wrestle with as a church in the city is that we understand that if we want to see gospel movement happen, we can't do it by ourselves. But if it has to be done our way and only our way, uh, we're not going to be partnering with very many people. So right away, we have to learn what it means to be unified. So that's a fantastic question. The way that I process and think through this is what are the closed handed issues and what are the open handed issues? So for me, the close-handed issues would be the things that are gospel center. Jesus is the only way to salvation. The Bible is authoritative. You know, those, those things. And if those things we can, we, can, we can agree on, even though like maybe I believe in believer's baptism and a church like Tim Keller believes in infant baptism, they're committed to the authority of God's word. They believe Jesus is the only way. We're going to be able to partner on a lot of things and be unified on a lot of different things you know um so so i think that's so clear in the center gospel center can be a little bit blurry on the edges you know what i mean so for example in the case of complementarianism and egalitarianism like well what can we partner with a church that has women pastors again i think the question asked that has to be asked is what are we necessarily partnering around you know what i mean if it's around a, a, like a social issue or a social cause or an injustice i think absolutely we can partner together because the gospel center is clear. 
However, I would say this is that once again, it all depends in terms of just how deep the partnership goes. Because sometimes you just have to answer the practical question of just how is it how how is it gonna how is it gonna work, like the like the the, the, the pragmatic side of things, right? Like it's it's very difficult to have a leadership team you know try to run a single organization when everyone is like in twenty different areas, right? So at some point, depending on how deep the partnership needs to go, I think the more the more we have to be aligned in our beliefs. But in regards to maybe bigger movements and more bigger and general issues, the more we can be more open-handed in terms of what those partnerships look like and, and the things that we hold op- closely and what we have with closed hands and also open hands. So yeah. every, every, everything's kind of case by case around stuff like that. Yeah, good, good way to say it, Sammy, uh, there. And so, yeah, a church that wasn't gospel-centered, that believed, let's just say, they believed uh, one way. Um, if there's like Cam Robinson, hurry up. Um, yeah, so if a church believe, hey, we're, we're, we're a church, but we believe there's many ways to Jesus, uh, we just we just picked Jesus. Obviously, we wouldn't partner with that church on any issue um, and because and, we wouldn't believe they're a genuine church. So, Cam, hurry up. Do, uh, you want to speak them? Take off the mic. You can speak them. Or are you typing them? Uh, what's your optimal view of the one church in Chicago? You mean besides Park Church, Lincoln Park? Is that what you mean? Hey, sorry, I was far away from the computer. Two questions. One is just what's what is like the to follow up to the question you were just say, answering, Kenson. What what is what is your what is the dream of a of a believer of a gospel centered church and and how the church can reach more of the city? Like what 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 is what is the what do those partnership what does that partnership look like? Not so like technical, just like what should the 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 Chicago church kind of look like? Um, and then I also just want to know what you're watching on TV, Jeff. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Okay, good. Oh, hey, can you see it? I don't, I'm not watching, but I think ABC is on, which is that stupid show. Well, I want to be careful. Being, it's that Bachelor or something. I don't know. Yeah, what that's, that's what we thought. Okay. But yeah, I'm not are, Joe, are you watching The Bachelor, dude? Are you for I'm real? I'm not watching it. I, had a, I watch ABC World News with David Muir, and I haven't changed it off. Oh, my gosh. I got caught. And this is being recorded right now. Oh, yeah, my. oh, is it being recorded? Okay. I like yeah. it's reflecting in my glasses. How funny is yeah, that? My, 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 wife, uh, my wife recently got, got, uh, got trapped into Love is Blind on, on Netflix or whatever. Oh, and no. I, was like, I was like, what is this? What is this thing that you're watching? She's like, it's so fascinating. I was like, you've got to stop watching that thing. Okay, okay. sorry. Tangent. Okay. Thumbs up. You see Joanna Wee on the call. <laughs> uh, so, so let me go and answer this question that the last one. Up. What's up? Yeah. Yeah. What's the optimal view of the one church in, in Chicago? I think at the end of the day is that it's a church that is committed to preaching the gospel, to, to being a biblical church that is that is rooted on the foundation of scripture. You know what I mean? That that is that is that is the one optimal church because if a church is committed to scripture, committed to scripture, it will preach the gospel. It will lead people to God. It will glorify God because you can't be faithful to Scripture. On, you can't be faithful to Scripture and not head in those directions. So that's what I want to see happen. I want to see churches that are just just radically committed to Scripture and just preaching it and preaching the gospel of grace. And obviously, Chicago being 77 neighborhoods, I don't want to see the same cookie cutter church in every single neighborhood. I want Bible preaching churches that look just as diverse as the world does. You know what I mean? I want I don't want the church in Little Village to look like the same church at Near North or Lincoln Park or whatever, you know what I mean? So that, that's that's what I want to see. That's what I want to see happen. That's that's what the one church looks like is that we all come together and once again, just like just like for, just like for all of you, the reason that you're committed to a church right now is because it's a church that's committed to the Bible. That's no right. different. No different. That's what that's what we want to see with the partnership of all the churches is that it's the centrality of the word. Yeah, and I would just echo that, emphasize that. I do think it's important, Cam. I'm, we're biased. Cam, uh, Kenton's biased. I'm biased. Like, let's just say you you move tomorrow to another city and you're looking for another church. How do they view the Bible? Like, look, go to their sermon, pay, go to their website, and see what do they, what have they preached through for the last six months? If it's again, I'm not saying topical churches aren't Jesus loving churches, but one of the beauties of uh, what, when you preach through the books of the Bible is that you, you have to preach them what the Bible says. Like Kenton doesn't have to make up um, this week's sermon. He doesn't have to think of, okay, let's, what's going to be the next four weeks? Let's do four weeks. Not to say you don't do a topical once a year, twice a year, 
but you want to look at a church and say, what are, what are they primarily, they primarily go through books. Oh, okay, great. That means they love the word of God. And my, again, so that to, that to me is a very important uh, criteria that I would look at when I like get on websites or people tell me, Joe, this is my church. I'll look up their website and I might reach out to a friend and be like, bro, you know, maybe there's another church you should uh, check out. But uh, Bible centrality, not saying, you know, I have friends that do topical churches, love them. But um, this is great. So Kenson, thank you. Though. So anyway, this is good. So you got, you got, you got the spots Kenson recommends there on the side. I love it. It's uh, Olive Garden breadsticks. What's your one last fun thing, Kenson? What are you and Susan watching on Netflix? I know you're a movie guy. Tell us one, two, one or two things you're like. Oh my gosh! I know you like. I know you like video games. So you know, Kenson's. I'm gonna. Yeah, write, I, he's a video. No, no. He's a video game guy. No, in, in regards to in regards to uh to uh. Um, TV shows. Um, the one that I've recently binged on, and I, I'm a late adopter to it, is Stranger Things. So I just got on that not too long ago, and uh, I it's like crack. I am so addicted. I'm now I'm now like going. I'm not I'm not following them all on Instagram. It's it's, it's really oh. bad. And then uh and then on TV, like my my wife and I, we really like watching a Blacklist and SWAT. So we watch those two shows a lot. My my wife loves reality uh like dating shows. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of those. So this is yeah. so fun. Hey, friends, this has been rich. Let me close with some prayer, and then we'll end the call. So, Father, thank you for tonight. We bless you. Just thanks for the attentiveness of the class. Just get so fired up seeing people engage week after week. This really this crew coming back and wanting to learn more. Thanks for Kenson. Thanks for in the midst of a crazy schedule and and a wife, four kids, and uh, really uh, just coming to bless us tonight with the gifts you've given him. So uh, give us all a good night, God. And just day by day, God, help us to trust in you. None of us are promised Wednesday. And we're not even promised tomorrow yet. So you control every beat of our hearts. We don't. And so we're mindful of that. So if you wake us up in the morning, God, help us to trust you with Tuesday and honor you and glorify you. And uh, we love you. Bless the church. Thank you for Park Church, which most of us are a part of. There are a few other churches represented. So God, we just thank you for Park. Other Bible-believing churches in this city that are proclaiming Christ. May your hand of blessing uh, be upon them all. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You have a great night, okay? God bless everybody.